Hopefully we'll make a start. You're all very welcome to our special meeting. Um, Monday the 8th of March, I'm going to ask Tom McFarland as the lead officer to take us through the notice and summons of meeting and the attendance and apologies, please. And can I just ask everyone who's not speaking at the moment to mute their microphones, please? Thank you, Karen. Okay, thank you, Mayor, and uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, members, you are hereby summoned to attend the special meeting of Derry City and Straban District Council to be held remotely on Monday the 8th, 2021 at 4 p.m. So I'll start uh, with taking the attendance. Um, Alderman Bresland. It'll be a long wee bit later on, so I will. Alderman Devaney. Here. Alderman Guy. Here. Alderman Hussey. Alderman Kerrigan. Here. Alderman McClintock. Here. Alderman McCready. Alderman Ramsey. Here. Alderman Wart. Here, Karn. Councillor Barr, Jason. Apologies, Karn. Councillor Barr Raymond. Apologies, Karen, for, for Raymond Barr. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Boyd. Uh, Which one, Karen? John, first. Right, that's me, thank you. And Councillor Boy Michaela. Uh, and Shaw, Karen, here. Councillor Burke. And Shaw. Councillor Carr. Here, Karen. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cusack. <clears throat> Councillor Dobbins. Here, Karen. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Joy. Here, Karen. Councillor Duffy. Councillor Durkin. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Ferguson. Here, Karen. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Gallagher. Councillor Harkin. Here. Councillor Jackson. And Shaw. Councillor Kelly. Karen. Councillor Log. And Shaw. Councillor McCann. Councillor Maguire. Councillor McKee. Councillor McKeever. Here, Karen. Councillor McKinney. Here, Karen. Councillor Mellon. And Shaw, Karen. Councillor Minnie. Councillor Riley. Here, Karen. And to Councillor Tierney. Here, Karen. Thank you. Mary, Karen, just you before just... you move off, this Councillor Riley here, before you move yep. off the apologies, um, could we just note that there's a power outage in the city today, so that may be affecting a number of people, including Councillor Mooney. Uh, and Mayor, when I have the mic, if I could ask that you as Mayor just record condolences to Councillor Jason Barr on the death of his uncle, Kieran. Thank you. Yep, no problem, Councillor Riley. Karen, can I just check that you got Councillor Gallagher? I seen him respond, but I never heard him. Yeah, I'll record that, Mayor. Yep, he's online there. I can see him. Uh, and members, <coughs> moving on. Um, and anyone who does join us late will likely add it under the chat box, um, and we'll have that recorded then. So moving on to item number three, the statement of remote meetings. And I would like to remind everyone who is in remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and the media. This broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. The broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council's protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to be filmed and to the use and storages of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purposes of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. 
a copy of the council privacy notice may be found on the council website at www.derrystraban.com. Members, item number four is declarations of members' interest, which can be shared now or as they arise um, throughout our meeting. Um, if you just pop a note in the chat box, we'll try to keep an eye on them. Item five is chairperson's business. Um, the only uh, item that I have, as, as Contra Riley has already mentioned, they record uh, condolences to Jason Barr on the death of his uncle. Um, and we will uh, write to the, the, the Councillor Barr um, to, to express those condolences on your behalf, members. Item number six um, is our uh, open for information. Um, and we're going to hear from some groups who are challenging racism and sectarianism um, right across our community. Members, I uh, plan to take those groups as they're outlined um, in the agenda. Um, after each deputation, we'll have a short period for questions and, and, and comments from members. So our first um, is United Against Racism um, to receive a presentation from them. So I welcome uh, those representatives to the microphone, please. Um, thank you very much um, for having me. My name is Sivanka Antova and I'm the convener of United Against Racism Belfast. Um, I'm very pleased and very excited to be here on International Women's Day. So congratulations to all uh, members of the and Straban Council. Solidarity as well. Um, I also specifically want to uh, thank Sharon for making joining this uh, meeting really easy for me and for accommodating me to go first. I apologize in advance for not being able to stay until the end of all the excellent presentations uh, we have today. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about sharing a little bit about United Against Racism as an all-Ireland anti-racism platform. And a little bit more specifically on the Belfast branch, which is the newest branch of this activist platform and the ways in which we have um, stood up to the far right in, uh, in our community and in the way in which we have fought for um, human rights and for racial equality and racial justice. Um, as I said, UAR is an all-Ireland activist platform. We have, I think, seven or eight branches across the island, and we have the exact same uh, uh, policies and principles across the island. We are a democratic platform uh, led by members. All the decisions in United Against Racism are taken by our members, and we are a platform open to absolutely everybody. As long as people agree with the UAR principles, which can be found on our website, um, the platform is free for people who have very little experience in being anti racist, uh, people who um, come from a particular path of life and they want to contribute their knowledge and lived experience, um, people of any political persuasion or no political persuasion. In that sense, our uh, style of uh, working and organizing and the essence of our activist platform is based on the importance of broad fronts and movements against the far right and against racism. Um, these are huge problems only becoming more acute in the context of um, the COVID pandemic and the financial crisis. Um, so these um, issues like uh, racism, institutional racism or the racism that individuals perpetrate against each other require broad fronts. They require all hands on deck. They require everybody to be involved. Our Belfast branch, uh, branch sorry, was formed in 2018 after two um, in, in incidents where um, mosques in Belfast and in Newton Arts were vandalized. Um, a lot of completely ordinary folks like myself uh, thought that we need a platform for ordinary folks who don't want such Islamophobic and racist attacks to be perpetrated in their communities, not in our name. It's not anything that we've ever wanted to see or that we want to stand and idly observe without doing something about it. So in um, meetings with the Belfast Islamic Center, um, and a big public meeting at the time in the Queen's University Belfast, 
uh, main campus, very close to the mosque in the Belfast Islamic Center, we set up the Belfast branch of UAR. And since then, what we've done is focus uh, very much on working with individuals and other organizations, um, building these fronts, building these connections between people um, in the same shared community between different organizations is, is extremely important. And that's what we focused on. Um, we have also engaged quite proactively with trade unions. Uh, we think that whenever the far right try to organize, either in Belfast or in Derry or in any place um, in Northern Ireland, <clears throat> it should be the workers of Northern Ireland and their trade unions that have a key role in opposing the far right, in opposing their uh, politics of fear and division and scapegoating migrants for long-standing and historic problems. Um, for example, with um, the health system or education or uh, public safety. Um, I just wanted to give you also a few examples of how we have operated as an anti-racism platform, because I suppose the point of today um, following the motion of Councillor Harkin is how we can ensure that atrocities uh, like the Holocaust never happen again. Um, in private conversations with my family and friend, friends, we sometimes refer to racism as the Hydra monster, the monster that has a thousand heads. You cut one head off and two more um, appear in its place. And what we mean by that, what we allude to is that racism is allowed to impact heavily on the safety and dignity of our brothers and sisters whenever um, the majority stands idle and doesn't um, take a proactive stance against racism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, anti-migrant rhetorics. Um, so this is one way of us learning from each other on how best to um, confront racism in our communities. So one of the first examples of our community work was again in um, 2018 in the Rosetta area of South Belfast. We had very disgusting Islamophobic leaflets being spread um, in the area, being put through people's letterboxes. Um, it was from um, a little known um, uh, group um, we later on did some investigation. We realized that the group is fronted and funded by um, recognized um, far right individuals. The leaflet was uh, very aggressive in its language. It was very frightening to receive something like that through your letterbox. And it was certainly designed to intimidate and to terrorize. So once we got news that this leaflet is being spread in the Rosetta area of Belfast, we created our own UAR Belfast leaflet, which was all about um, solidarity and friendship and not giving in to fear and intimidation and constructions about migrants or Muslim people. And when we were spreading them, it felt like we were not having perhaps the most obvious or dramatic effect on the community, but we certainly got people getting in touch with us to say that when they receive the counter, if you wish, leaflet, one that demonstrates that not the whole community or not the whole local area agrees with that type of aggressive persecution of, of uh, Muslim people, they felt more secure and more supported in their community. So that's one fairly simple example that all of us can take when we hear about intimidation in our area. Another thing that United Against Racism um, involved ourselves in quite heavily was in 2019 when we organized, I think, at least two big counter demonstrations against the far right. When I say the far right, I mean organizations like Generation Identity, Britain First, uh, people uh, from um, various insidious far right organizations who were marching through Belfast, basically unopposed at the time. Um, it was a demonstration of how casual intimidation of people can, can be for some parts of the extreme far right. 
Um, so United Against Racism organized peaceful and dignified counter demonstrations with the uh, exceptional help of the trade union movement at the time um, as a way of showing uh, to um, any far right um, activist or fear, uh, uh, fear spreading person that Belfast is not a place where you can organize without being opposed. You know, people have been through a lot. They have a, a difficult history of overcoming conflict and division. And Belfast or any place in Northern Ireland is not free for, for taking. So this was an important part of our anti-racism work. Because counter demonstrations can be quite well confrontational at times, they can be quite, I suppose, they have a, a a constructed connotation of being violent, even though we've never had any instance of violence on any of other events. Um, we were looking in 2019 to organize uh, a peaceful, always a peaceful, uh, a peaceful and, and positive uh, event. They can celebrate the wonderful diversity that migrants bring to Northern Ireland, to celebrate all the achievements the people, the people have, and to basically stand up against the politics of division in a in a in a positive way, full of friendship and solidarity. And we organized the Diversity Carnival in 2019, which continues to be one of the nicest days in my life as an activist. It was beautiful. Belfast was um, Belfast saw so a historic moment, really, where migrants were marching through Belfast, openly celebrating themselves. There was a lot of music and, and color and a lot of um, a lot of positivity and a spirit of celebration, but it was still an important way of uh, protesting fear and division. Um, I do want to mention that what was the big hindrance to the diversity carnival and often is the experience of uh, migrant people, minority ethnic people when dealing with institutions. The big hindrances to the diversity carnival was the institutional response. And this is where I think elected representatives like all of you in Darien Straban City Council have a particular role to play. We were stopped by different departments. Belfast City Council had problems with the diversity carnival and different institutions, not at all related seemingly to Belfast City Council, wrote us letters, the Parades Commission put us through a lot of loopholes that a lot of other parades and gatherings don't go through. So I think that was an example really of institutional racism, of a beautiful celebration of migrants and um, the diversity in our shared society being um, being constrained for absolutely no good reason, if you ask us. So I think I wanted to mention that because I that's a direct nod to the role you can play as elected representatives when black or minority ethnic people uh, in your constituencies try to organize in a peaceful and dignified way. Um, during the COVID pandemic, a lot of our, our activism has been online. Mainly, we have focused on using our growing platform for organizing key uh, public meetings on key issues, whether it's been racism, whether it's been um, highlighting the work and supporting the work of different organizations in a difficult for them time. Um, this is where we have focused. Um, we organize our UAR conferences as well. There is one coming up on the 21st of March. It's our All Ireland Anti Racism Conference. We uh, invite um, anti racism activists from around the world to share their thoughts and experiences with anti racism activists here. And of course, in 2020, what marked, I think, a historic moment for the anti racism. Uh, movement in Northern Ireland were the 6th of June 2020 Black Lives Matter protests in Derry and Belfast. We, we were uh, the organizers of the Belfast uh, rally. I think it's especially important to focus a little bit specifically on BLM and on the 6th of June because we're all trying to create a space where all of us understand that we have a responsibility to oppose the, the far right. We have, an, uh, we have a responsibility to speak out whenever we see institutional racism or brutality, systemic brutality against members of our community. And that's what the 6th of June was really about. Um, 
It was a peaceful, a socially distanced, meticulously planned, um, dignified and respectful protest in both Belfast and Derry. Um, in, in Belfast, I know the figures for Belfast, whilst the people in attendance were a limited number, there were 30,000 people watching the speeches from Custom House Square online, which just shows you that Northern Ireland, despite what some people may try to say, as a whole is a place open to solidarity and uh, radical friendship between people. Um, I think we demonstrated with the 6th of June how a community can come together in the spirit of uh, unity. Of course, I think we all know by now that what followed the 6th of June and the Black Lives Matter protests was what I can only describe as political repression. We are talking about 70 fines for peaceful protesters who were, in my case, I was fined hours before the event when I was perfectly socially distancing by myself. So we saw 70, at least 70 fines between Derry and Belfast. We saw multiple people being cautioned whilst actively ensuring social distancing for, for other people. And we saw organizers being reported to the Public Prosecution Service under the Serious Crimes Act as if they committed a serious crime at the time. Um, and whilst there's been an incredibly um, vocal and broad public support for the BLM movement here in Northern Ireland, the institutional response was very different. Now we have two reports, one by the um, police ombudsman uh, and one by the policing board and I, um, very much showing in practice how BLM activists were treated disproportionately and unfairly. And that leaves us all with I think a better understanding than ever of how institutional racism can work and what the responsibility of each and one of us is to confront it when we see it. I'm very grateful to Derry and Straban uh, Council for very early on, before, for example, Belfast City Council passing a motion in support of the BLM activists. I hope that you will stand true and strong by your commitment for justice and fairness, and you will ensure that there is appropriate redress for people who are penalized for um, speaking out against racism in, um, in our society. And as the last thing I really want to, to say, one of the questions I was asked when preparing for this presentation was, where do we go next? What do we do next? Of course, where we go next is we continue, first of all, with the 6th of June campaign. Nearly a year later, BLM activists are still waiting for redress, for justice and fairness, even though, <clears throat> apologies, the examples of different policing of gatherings amounting one after the other for these, I don't know, 10, 9, 10 months since the 6th of June. So we continue with that campaign. Specifically, United Against Racism will continue supporting um, grassroots narratives and initiatives to combat racism. We'll continue amplifying when we can, as we can, the voices of Black and minority ethnic people, but will continue our work on building community capacity so people can be the bringers of change that they want, as opposed to passively waiting for it. And we're going to continue conversations about public policy and legislation that is needed to address that big gap in relation to racism. And of course, we welcome wonderful initiatives like La Kayla being formed, these broad uh, fronts against the rise of the far right and against unfairness and the politics of fear to continue to emerge and to strengthen. Um, I'm very excited that you get to hear from amazing activists like uh, Lillian Sinoy Barr and Steph Hanlon um, tonight, who've led the way in how we can all stand united against racism. So thank you very much. That's me. I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, members, can I just, um, before we move on to the next presentation, um, Mary Durkin, Alderman Alan Bresland, Rooney McHugh, and Derek Hussey have arrived late. Members, my apologies. My chat box isn't working. I can see the messages coming through, but I can't respond. So when we get to the questions and answers, if you still put your message on, I'll see it. But I'm not being rude by not responding to you. You'll be on the list. Um, 
I don't know what's wrong um, with it today. So we'll move on to B is a presentation from Stephanie Hallam. Stephanie. Hi everyone, thank you very, very much for having me. My name is Steph Hanlon and I am one of the founding members of Akeva. Now, I'm just wondering how I uh, share my presentation. So, you can give me one second. If not, I know the presentation has been circulated, so I can just speak to that. Paul Jackson's on the call. Can you give some support there, Paul? Yeah, give me a second. I'll share it for you now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so I just want to start off by uh, wishing everyone a very happy International Women's Day and uh, to say thank you very much uh, for this for this invitation. Thank you so much to Sharon, who has been very helpful in facilitating this and to uh, Councillor Harkin for this motion. It is so encouraging and heartwarming to have uh, local councillors reach out to the Kayla and under other grassroots organisations like United Against Racism, who are doing such fantastic work uh, to mark uh, the Holocaust Memorial. I think when we reflect on the Holocaust Memorial and, and um, on, the, on the Holocaust, um, you know, this really highlights the importance of working together and the seriousness with which we need to address the rise of the far right across the world and indeed this island. Um, I just want to say a few words about Akela, about who we are, about the how the alliance came about and uh, the work that we are doing as an anti-fascist coalition. And in particular, I want to you know, talk about heeding the warning signs and uniting against uh, the rise of fascism. And um, as Ivanka mentioned, challenging the far right, challenging racism, misogyny, sexism, homophobia, these require broad fronts and all hands on deck. And that's why I'm, I am here today to talk to you. So as we have here, the CAVA is a all island broad civil society coalition of which United Against Racism is a, an affiliated member. So we com are comprised of public figures, activists, social justice organizations, and many individual members that have formed and come together to counter the rise of fascism and far right politics in Ireland. So we commit ourselves to the principles of anti fascism, anti racism, social equality, and opposition to all forms of discrimination, racism, bigotry, and hate. Now, just, just one or two um, of our groups, just to mention, um, are the National Women's Council, the Transgender Equality Network, and the Union of Students in Ireland, as well as multiple political parties. It is also, um, we are welcoming support from every single group across Ireland. Um, and um, can we move to the next slide? Thank you very much. So this is just a snippet of some of the organisations that are on board with Michaela. So, as you can see, this actually, this image is out of date. So we have a lot of more organizations that have come on board since, which is very, very exciting. And uh, the Kayla continues to grow and expand. Okay, we can, we can move on to the next slide. So just about the growth of the far right in Ireland and how uh, the Kayla came about. Okay, so, you know, I think it's really important to recognize um, the social, the political and the economic context uh, in which the far right are occurring. Okay, we are witnessing, you know, deepening inequality in Ireland and globally, disillusionment with the establishment. And what we're seeing is the decline of public faith in science and in rationality as capitalism, you know, repeatedly fails to deliver on its promises. So what we're really witnessing, and a lot of people, you know, are recognizing this, is the rise of conspiracy theories. And largely what that stems for is it from is, is looking to leadership. There is a lack of public trust in governments and people are looking for answers. There is a political vacuum. And this is where we're seeing this occur. Okay, so we're seeing a lot of moral panics around conspiracies, such as QAnon and Hands of Fair Children. And really, where we see massive platforms for this, these breeding grounds uh, are really in relation to social media corporations. This is something that the far right observatory has noted and has been extremely concerned about. And it's something that elected officials um, in the Dáil are starting to raise awareness of. 
Okay, so this really is important to recognize that Facebook, Twitter, and Google, they remain central to the growth and the normalization of the far right narratives and their organization. Okay, so, you know, this really is something that we need to, I suppose, understand and recognize um, that these are platforms that enable highly committed people to travel from other counties and, and countries to bolster the attendance at various events. And we cannot underestimate both the levels of coordination and organization amongst the far right, but also how these platforms facilitate this. Uh, can we have the next slide? Thank you. So in relation to COVID-19, you know, everything I've mentioned there, it has absolutely exacerbated entrenched systems of, um, of inequality and oppression. And this is recognized in the most recent Oxfam report that was released in February, in which it referred to uh, the global pandemic, uh, COVID-19, as the inequality virus. OK, so I really would encourage you to have a look at that. You know, it's it's absolutely stark in the way um, this world has become more unequal. And really what it has done, it has primed Ireland and internationally for a new pandemic of misinformation. OK, so what we're seeing is far right actors using public scepticism about public health restrictions, about lockdowns, about travel guidelines and masks, and using this to amplify far right anti-establishment anti rhetoric. So, you know, really, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, very, very specific organizations and individuals are using this time, this time of uncertainty, this period of fear, anxiety and frustration, not just with the establishment, but with the pandemic and, and with society at large and capitalizing on that. Okay, polarization and division are driving and fueling this. OK, so, you know, when we're talking about, I suppose, taking taking action, this really, really involves, I suppose, um, a wider, a wider lens for how we view um, the events that are unfolding in front of our eyes. Uh, kind of the next slide. Thank you very much. So in relation to um, Ireland, particularly, we have witnessed the increasing visibility um, of the far right and Lakeila grew out of an event uh, that was held in uh, July last year, uh, where a protest was organized in, um, in Dublin outside the Dáil to call for the resignation of a TD, Aidan O'Reardon. The rally was organized by leaders of uh, Ireland's um, main far-right parties, as well as prominent far-right activists. Protesters stood outside the gates of the Dáil with, with uh, placards and with banners of nooses. This included the uh, Irish Freedom Party and the National Party, and this became a platform for homophobic attacks and further conspiracy theories um, about the extreme LGBT lobby pervading our schools. Okay, and in this, anti-racism activists that, that condemned it were accused of being in favour of paedophilia. Uh, prominent LGBTQ activists were struck over the head with a piece of wood with the tricolour attached to it and was seriously injured. Okay, so what originally was, or initially, and um, traditionally in Ireland, um, has been an unorganised small minority fringe group is gaining increasing traction, increasing visibility, but most importantly, is gaining confidence. And this is something that I think is really bringing us into a new era. We witnessed the Grafton Street protests, and when we're talking about um, the grounds, the grounds really um, the conditions in which fascism grows is, I want to argue, like Ivanka had, had, had uh, mentioned, the institutional responses. Okay, so when we're looking at inequality and oppression, these stem for structural violence. And structural violence, it begets violence. So this is seen in institutional racism, sexism, homophobia, and this justifies cultural violence and it facilitates direct violence. And this is what we are witnessing, uh, as with last July, um, and as with the protests in Grafton Street in Dublin. The institutional response to these protests were very worrying. Um, you know, there were false claims and accusations by the Garda Commissioner on the involvement of both far right and far left groups. It's very concerning because it really facilitated and enabled the spread of misinformation by the far right. There was the indiscriminate use of violence and backgrounds by police authorities, and there was quite a quite an overarching narrative 
of uh, the dismissal of the role played by organized fascist groups and the gains by far right actors. And I think, you know, this is extremely important to recognize because we cannot dismiss uh, the importance and I suppose the seriousness of this situation. Um, there was a framing of protests that was quite classist in character. So a lot of um, protesters were seen as, you know, um, basically from the city centre, people who were seen as, as basically lacking in cognitive resources. And all protesters were tarred as extreme and far right. And for us, we are saying that this is not the way to go about it. It serves to further polarise and isolate people who are looking for answers and people who are really facing the brunt of inequalities that are exacerbated by COVID-19. So um, next slide, please. So lastly, what I really, really want to call on um, on representatives of, of Derry and Strabane and, and what we are currently calling on organisations and individuals across Ireland is to take affirmative action. OK, so this, this does not occur in a vacuum. We must recognise that the conditions for fascism are present in society and through our social and political landscape as a result of not just economic conditions, but political inequality, social inequality. So we need to hold media corporations to account. We are very much um, encouraging political representatives to um, put more pressure on media corporations to deplatform exclusionary, far right, fascist, and hateful rhetoric that is inciting violence and spreading misinformation. Also, we really are cautioning about the over reliance on state apparatus and police authorities to stop the far right. This is not where we are going to stop it. We need to be preventative in measures. We need to stop it at its root causes. We also need to take actors and the associated threats extremely seriously. And lastly, we really need to support and engage in the work by anti fascist organizations like United Against Racism, like Michaela. I mean, and on and, and every single one of the groups that are here presenting today, fantastic groups that are doing amazing work. But most importantly, you know, we need to be the drivers of change. We cannot look to organizations or someone else. We must be in this together and we must, uh, you know, the only way that we are going to succeed in defeating the far right and fascism is by coming together, is by uniting together and standing together in solidarity. Uh, like we have the hashtag uh, diversity, not division. We celebrate diversity, we work in solidarity, and we come together despite our differences. So, like I said, Lakela is an extremely broad coalition. We have progressive organizations and individuals that have come from across all parts of society and civil society who have come together uh, with the common concern and the common aim of preventing the growth of the far right, because this is something that affects every single one of us. For LGBTQ organizations that are joining, people's bodies have become a political background, uh, a political, political battleground for the far right. For people who are visibly disabled, people's bodies become a political back, a political uh, battleground for the far right. Okay, for people of color and people from the black ethnic minority groups, once again, people's bodies have become a political black um, battleground. Okay, so we really, really encourage, encourage, um, you know, members here today as leaders of the local community, as elected representatives and as public figures, you know, each person here plays an absolutely vital role in organizing and opposing the far right and the rise of fascism. And I'm appealing to each of you to join uh, the Kayla. Um, because we have, you know, options for individual membership, we have options for um, organizational membership, and we are welcoming absolutely everyone who is willing to sign up and agree to our principles, and they are available on our website. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Perfect. These are the links to get involved. So, like I said, you can sign up individually, you can become a member. I'm telling you, you know, like Kayla, we want if your if your granny is part of a sewing group or a knitting group, we want your granny's group to get involved. Okay, if your if your son is part of a sports club, we want that sports club to sign up and get involved. We have sports groups, we have boxing groups, we have theater groups. 
all who are getting involved. And like I said, this is a community effort. It is an all Ireland effort. And to be honest, it's an effort that every single person has a strong role to play in. So also you can donate. That is another key aspect because this is completely voluntary. And we have been um, appealing to the local community who have been absolutely fantastic and very supportive um, and very, very encouraging in relation to um, especially, essentially something that has become a part time job for our volunteers. And like I said, if we are organizing and we are actually, you know, tackling misinformation and uh, disinformation, we really uh, we do need your help in relation to you know, distributing materials, but also um, reaching out to people. Okay, so um, I think that's really it. Uh, I just want to say a massive thank you. These are some of our members uh, from uh, travelers organizations, from migrant solidarity um, organizations, politi political representatives, and key volunteers and activists within the organization, and much, much more. Um, there are several ways you can get involved. And I really encourage you that you know everyone here, um, when we finish this meeting, uh, you know, or even join the meeting, please click on the link, uh, sign up to the Kayla, and it would just be fantastic to have you because, like I said, we need an extremely broad membership and, and basis if we are going to come together and do this uh, successfully and um, and really, really enrich, enrich our community um, and essentially send a very, very strong mes message that Derry, that Kilkenny, that Carlo, that Dublin, that Belfast, and there is no place for exclusionary, for discriminatory, for xenophobic and hateful rhetoric to be here. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Stephanie, for your presentation on behalf of Lakela. Um, we'll come to the, the, the questions um, just in a, a few minutes, hopefully. Um, Karen, can I also just record that Councillor Paul Fleming and Sean Mooney are both in attendance as well? On the chat box there. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, item C is Becca Boer and Sue Patel, the Jewish Voice for Just Peace Ireland, uh, for to make a presentation over to yourselves, Becca and Sue. And just before I do, Alderman McCready is also in attendance, Karen. Apologies, Contras, I can't respond via the chat box, so my apologies. Uh, so we'll have Becca and Sue, please. Thank you. Okay. Go Thank ahead. you. We uh, we have a, a, a PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, Sue will take us through it. Thank you. Okay. Trinona Waigach, Dinya, Tame Sastave and Shaw, August Buai Lama Wehusagold, Koliachaha Dira, August and Kianta and Trabwan, Leven Shaw and Yogas and Jesho, a hot doing the law chess on Glo Yudach, a son Sheikh and Ko. So just I'm Sue Pentel. I just want to thank Darian City. Uh, and Straban City Council for the opportunity um, to speak to you today on behalf of JVJP. Just a quick word about myself. I'm part of a diverse group of um, Jewish people in Ireland. I'm actually from an Orthodox Jewish background in North London, and I've been living in Belfast since 1976. And along the way, I had the privilege of learning Irish. So. Slightly mixed accent there. I hope I don't confuse you guys. So, as I've said, Jewish Voice for a Just Peace is a diverse group of Jewish people throughout Ireland who support the Palestinian struggle for human rights and justice. And we see that as a struggle that resonates with the Irish journey towards peace. Next slide, please. Um, we're part of a long historical Jewish tradition of fighting oppression and standing up for peace and justice. And we all share a history of struggle against racism, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We support those groups that are working against racism, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And it's been wonderful to hear from a couple of them today. And again, I think this is a very special event and fitting for International Women's Day. Um, we support those groups that are working to create a just and lasting peace in Palestine and the application of international law human and human rights to Israel, Palestine. And we support the call for boycott, divestments and sanctions against Israel as called for by Palestinian civil society. Um, we oppose the ongoing occupation of Palestinian land, 
the siege of Gaza, the brutal military repression and violence, the cynical use of the anti-Semitic label and the history of oppression and a number of people have mentioned the Holocaust um, to silence those who criticize Israel. And we totally oppose the view that Israel represents the Jewish people. Uh, we feel as Jews that we have an obligation to speak out for all human rights against all instances of racism. And when Israel claims that its actions against Palestine protect the Jewish community uh, um, globally and are done in our name, we feel we must stand up and object to that. As someone else has said today, not in our name. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so um, we're we're proud to be part of a growing a growing excuse me pro Palestinian Jewish community, um, and there's a global movement supporting the Palestinian struggle for human rights and justice. And we work with a number of groups, so Jewish groups, Jewish Voice for Peace, which is in America, Jewish Voice for a Just Peace UK. Jewish Network for Palestine and Israeli Academics in the UK, a number of Israeli organizations, Beth Salem, Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. And I know this is a, a very specific example, if you like, of, of racism, but we think it's really important. I want to highlight the Israeli Refuseniks and mention the movement for demilitarization of Israeli society. In January 2021, 60 high school, Israeli high school students published the Shministim letter. Shministim is a nickname for Israeli high school students. These are 18 year olds. And what we have to remember here is our 18 year olds, well, certainly at my age, my children were looking at college or work at 18. Israeli teenagers are looking at whether or not to go into the Israeli army. And on the basis of opposing Israeli policies of apartheid, their words and denial of the Nakba, these 60 high school students published a statement, but it didn't end there. Um, counselors should be aware that a, a young school student refusing to go in, into the army can face um, detention. Um, and there are a number of examples of that. One that I picked up recently was a young girl called Halel Rabin, who was released in, I think it was February of this year, after 56 days behind bars. And that is the sort of society that is being built in Israel. And uh, anybody who has a chance should check out the letter. It's very, it gives us hope that the young, young people in Israel are refusing to buy in to the um, agenda of oppression and denial of the existence of human rights of Palestine. We also work with um, those opposing uh, racism, racism anti-Semitism and, and Islamophobia in Ireland, the Irish Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Trade Union Friends for, of Palestine, Lakayla, delighted to hear from Lakayla today, and I know Becca has been involved. We were involved in the Facebook campaign where Facebook um, refused to allow uh, <clears throat> uh, anybody supporting BDS to publish. And one of our members, David Landy, was in the Dublin delegation recently. And I'd also like to point out that we've supported the Black Lives Matter campaign, but want to highlight that within days of George Floyd being shot down in cold blood in Minneapolis, Iyad al-Halak, a 32-year-old Palestinian who was going to his Jerusalem care center for the first time out of lockdown, was shot down in cold blood. Iyad was a, a, a young adult with autism. His care worker was there. He was stopped by Israeli security officials. He panicked, he ran, and he was shot dead. Now, some of you may have heard of this, but many will not. And this is just one example of um, the brutal treatment of Palestinian. I know we can use a lot of big words and talk about colonialism and oppression, but on a daily basis, if you check out what is going on in the occupied territories, this unfortunately is not unusual. Could we go on to the next slide, please? 
So we thought it was important to highlight the International Holocaust Remembrance um, Alliance definition of anti-Semitism and pose the question, is it anti-Semitic to criticize Israel? We recognize that anti-Semitism is a real problem, must be fought in all its forms, and the rise of anti-Semitism globally has to be put in the context of the, of the rise of the far right, and we've heard ample evidence of that today. That's been extremely useful. For our, from our point of view, the real fight against anti-Semitism must be joined to these other struggles against racism, and we would oppose the conflation of anti instances of anti-Semitism as the only form or the key form of racism, because it minimizes the impact on black and ethnic minority communities of these far right attacks. And while there have been instances of anti-Semitism in Ireland, we believe the best way to fight them is in this broader context. I want to just speak a wee bit about this definition because I know that it's been very, um, very prevalent and, and, a, and a key a key um, tool um, uh, for those promoting this definition to ban and criminalize criticism of Israel and of Zionism and silent support for Palestinian rights. This definition was adopted in 2016. There are two components. One is a 38, is, is a, is a, a, legally, a non-legally binding broad definition of anti-Semitism. 38 words long. So that's the first component. The second component are a series of illustrative examples. And the working definition specifically links criticism of Israel, description of Israel as apartheid or racist with anti-Semitism. In other words, it gives the right and the establishment. And I think Ivanka talked about institutionalized racism, to institutionalize, in a sense, denial of the struggle or the existence of Palestine, it gives them an opportunity to say, if you are criticizing Israel in any form, this is anti-Semitic, and we are here today to tell you that is not the case. As I've said, we're part of a broad, growing movement of Jewish organizations, both in the diaspora and within Israel, who uh, don't accept the the um, the link between um, anti-Semitism and criticism of Israel? And we're, what we're saying is that it's important to distinguish um, the um, it's important to distinguish hostility and prejudice against Jews as Jews, as we have seen historically, with legitimate criticism of Israel. And we just want to give you a couple of examples. We've mentioned the Facebook criticism. Academics and British universities, we had a classic example with our, um, our colleagues in England who were being directed to adopt the working definition and were being censored for criticizing Israel. And a number of them are Israeli academics living in England who are commenting on the land in which they were brought up and legitimately exercising their democratic right to shape and comment on Israeli policies. Um, and as I said, they are part of the growing movement um, in solidarity with Palestine, who in a sense are horrified by, if, if you like, um, taking the, the history and the, the, um, the example of the Holocaust and using it to defend such inhumane policies. This cynical use of the working definition has been actively opposed by 40 Jewish groups worldwide. Okay, so we could move on then. Just want to mention BDS, the boycott, divestment and sanctions. And um, this is a Palestinian led movement for freedom, justice and equality. And it upholds the simple principle that Palestinians are entitled to the same rights as the rest of, as, as the rest of humanity. And as Jews of conscience, we totally support that right. Um, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to read everything on the slide. I know that maybe members are, 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 are familiar, hopefully, with the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. This movement is only 11 years since its launch, and it was launched by um, from a call by Palestinian civil society, and it already has had a major impact um, in challenging international support 
for Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism. And um, in terms of the IHRA definition, there are numerous examples um, internationally and also inside Israel of using this to stop BDS support and movements from actually um, publicly um, voicing their support. And also some of the leaders have been arrested in Israel and some of those organizations have been banned, including some Irish organizations from going to Israel. Okay, and then I'm, I'm more or less finishing on the uh, vaccination apartheid slide. Thank you. Um, during the pandemic, has anything changed? You would ask yourself. Have we seen a, a, a more humane face of the um, um, occupying authority? Well, no, absolutely not. It's been business as usual for occupied Palestine during the pandemic. Um, I've given you the example of Iyad al-Halak, who was shot down going to his care centre in Jerusalem. During the crisis, Israel has continued to blockade the Gaza Strip. It con has conducted daily raids on the West Bank, regularly killing unarmed Palestinian children, women and men, and demolishing Palestinian homes and villages. So the occupation of land, the, the, the demolition of homes and villages has continued. Israel has continued to withhold tax money due to the PA, the Palestinian Authority, and finance the occupation through imposing high fines on Palestinians tried in its illegal military courts. And that has been highlighted recently um, by a UN committee. Um, people maybe have heard that Israel is leading, is a world leader in vaccine rollouts. And over half its own population of 9 million, so that's some 4.5 million people have received at least one shot of, of, of the two dose vaccine and many have received two doses, um, including those living in the Jewish settlements and the occupied territories. In fact, Israel has so much vaccine, it had offered 5,000 doses to Honduras and the Czech Republic from its surplus. However, most Palestinians living under Israeli control in the occupied territories have yet to receive a vaccine. And there was um, some news recently about um, vaccinating, Israel vaccinating those Palestinian workers who work in the settlements in order to protect its Israeli citizens. But even that meager offer, so we're looking at something under 5,000 vaccines for some four and a half million people has been withdrawn. We're not quite sure why, but um, it certainly is um, a very stark example of inequality and injustice in Israel-Palestine. Um, very briefly then, um, what we do, as I've said, we're spread throughout Ireland. We're active in Palestine, solidarity and anti-racist groups where we live. We have um, between us and that some of our members have been targets of anti-Semitic abuse and harassment. And I think it's very much part of this uh, right wing, um, um, right wing uh, surge. But again, we would situate that in the broader anti-racist response. And as we say, we would um, lobby, write press releases, send letters and join with our colleagues, both in the anti um, the pro-Palestine movement and the anti-racist movement to work together to um, raise awareness and to combat racism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in Ireland. So, Bokal Jeranach, um, the last slide then, please. Kogar Jasokas Buihas, thank you all very much. Um, congratulations to Darien Straban District Council for um, standing up to racism, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, for previously adopting a corporate policy to oppose Israeli apartheid. So for looking, out, for looking outside and taking a stand and for giving us a voice today. I think this has been quite um, a step forward for JVJP and we really welcome the opportunity um, to address you and to stand with um, the other groups working against um, anti anti um, working against racism, anti Semitism, and, and Islamophobia. Kayla, together we are strong. Garamayagov. 
Thank you, uh, Sue, for that uh, very informative presentation. Becca, is there anything you wish to add on behalf of the organization? No, no that's all right. She has covered it very well. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Next is uh, Lillian Sinoy Barr and Enya Quigley on behalf of the Northwest Migrants Forum. Hello, Brian. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having us here today. And as Sue said, it's very fitting when it is International Women's Day to have all women coming to address your council. Um, we're going to start and I will invite my colleague Enya to give a, a few slides and then I'll take over. Can you all see that okay? Is that Sharon? Yeah, we can see it, Anya. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm just going to give a wee bit of background about our organisation and the work that we're doing, and then I'm going to pass these over to Lillian. So about us. So the Northwest Migrant Forum exists to serve and protect the interest of Black and minority ethnic people living in Derry um, and the Northwest of Northern Ireland. Um, our membership comprises of 68 different nationalities. Um, including in this, we would have um, 28 African countries, nine European countries, three South African countries, nine Asian countries, Canadians, Australians, Americans, six Middle Eastern countries, and mixed race families from UK and Ireland. Um, we see ourselves as a United Nation in Northern Ireland, um, with every migrant, a person from minority ethnic backgrounds and their families can and do identify with and affiliates with. Our focus, so our work is focused on creating equal and shared society that promotes respect for difference, genuine inclusion, recognition and integration of minority ethnic communities. And we believe we are part of Northern Ireland and not an additional part of it. Our community is equipped with knowledge, skills and ability to not only promote a shared and safer and diverse Northern Ireland, but play a critical role in making Northern Ireland more inclusive and prosperous. So some of the activities um, that we do, our work, um, directly responds to the needs of migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers and their families. Um, we provide them with welfare support, information, advice uh, across a range of issues, um, a safe space to connect and make connections with people from the two traditional communities here, create educational opportunities, raising awareness of minority ethnic rights across public institutions, Build genuine capacity, confidence, and capabilities to actively participate in public, economic, and cultural life here in the North. Support integration of newcomers through a variety of activities, such as we have a Friendly Faces Club. So, this is a non judgmental space where people can build new and maintain existing relationships to promote physical and mental well being, keep intercultural dialogue alive connecting people from diverse backgrounds and help prevent social isolation and create a safe space for open dialogue, dialogue on race and racism here. Um, and we also have conversational English language classes, so that helps improve communication and also creates a sense of belonging. So last year we worked with a group of refugee and migrants and we've done um, Dairy Lingo and the BBC done a wee clip on it. So when we share this um, slide, you can have a wee look at the video. So this, um, our Let's Talk project, um, which was Let's Talk Cultural Diversity, which was funded by the Dairy City and Strand District Council, the Peace Four Funds. So that gave us the opportunity to work with 11 schools and in total 124 young people who engaged over the course of a year. So the specific focus of this was for young people to have the opportunity to openly discuss religion, politics, ethnicity and the impact of the past on young people's futures. So we've done a range of educational visits. Um, we went to the Stormont. We went to um, the Islamic Centre in Belfast and the Jewish Centre as well. 
Um, we had such good engagement. It was a very good, uh, successful program, which enabled us um, because of its success and its engagement levels, it enabled us to maintain and increase our numbers for our intercultural youth intervention programs. Um, so our intercultural youth intervention programs focus on improving attitudes between young people from different backgrounds, promote better understanding between communities, community integration and foster good relations and create opportunities for young people to make contact with different, spend time together and develop friendships in a fun, safe and supportive learning environment. And we also established a youth committee where we have 12 young people who meet regularly to ensure that the voices of the young people are being heard. They also attend all our steering group meetings and they help lead and develop our youth programs. And we ran programs throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Um, one of the things that we've done was provide um, food parcels for our service users who have no recourse to public funds. We also um, provided financial support as well through our crisis fund for people with no uh, recourse to public funds who maybe lost their jobs um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and they can't apply for benefits. Um, our Friendly Faces Club was taken online, which created a virtual space for um, our users to stay connected and to keep in contact with others. And advocacy and racial inequalities awareness raising. So we had our Black History Month where we've done a series of events throughout the month. We have our Campaign for Change, which is ongoing, um, our Effective Activism Project and our Tuesday Challenge events that just finished there on Sunday. So I'm just going to pass you over to Lillian now. Thanks, Enya. Would you please go to the next slide? So uh, in 2020, uh, I think a lot of people really wondered why black and minority ethnic people here in Northern Ireland would go to a protest. Uh, I think it is important to reflect and remember that on the 25th of May, 2020, George Floyd, a 46 year old man who was black, was killed by the police. And just to remind you that today actually is the beginning of the trial of Derek Chauvin, who, who, who the police officer who killed George Floyd. That act of violence was captured on video and it is sparked outrage around the world, leading to protests globally. For us Black people here and around the world, the video was a reminder of many other such acts of racially motivated violence by law enforcement officials where the perpetrators have never been charged or prosecuted. It was also deeply traumatic as it highlighted that there is no equality before the law. It was a very painful reminder that while it may take different forms in different societies, systemic and institutional racism is something we have to live with every day. Next. So why did we protest in Northern Ireland? The Life and Times um, survey, which was published just in January 2021, and it examined racism in Northern Ireland, showed that attitude towards black and minority ethnic groups have not improved since 2016. Fewer people reported having Black or Eastern European friends in 2019 than in previous years. The promotion, the, the proportion who claimed to have Black friends was lower in 2019 than at any time in previous years. The same uh, Life and Time survey also found that 38% that of 18 to 24 year olds would not accept an Eastern European as a friend. 47% of over 65 will not accept a Muslim as a close friend. And again, 18 to 24 year olds were the most intolerant towards BME people. A third of 18 to 24 year olds won't even accept a Muslim as a neighbor and in the local, in their own local area. This is higher than, sorry, I just, and this was higher than any other age group aside from six, uh, the over 65. 
No? Okay. If we go back to January, a very good example uh, of the latest hate crime attacks was the Belfast Multicultural Association. The attack was just the icing of the cake for racist. BMCA volunteers, I am a member, by the way, of the BMCA, so I would know how many people and how many times that they have been attacked, volunteers, when they go to work in the center. They were terrorized, their properties were damaged, with no action taken at all. Reports were made to the police, but the inaction of the PSNI gave us racist the green light to set fire on the building. Okay, let's look at the statistic from the PSNI. Although there was a reduction in both racist incidents and crimes throughout January to December 2020, in our local area here in Derry, there was an increase of 12 racist incidents and an increase of 13 racist crimes within this time. Derry City and Straban area has seen the largest increase of racist incidents in January 2019 to 2020 December. Um, the area also seen the second highest increase of racist crimes in, in Northern Ireland, January to December. In comparison, in this time frame, Derry City and Straban District area sectarian incidents reduced by 49 cases and sectarian crime, crimes reduced by 42. Given the fact that there is lockdown, a large period of 20, throughout 2020 and 2021, these statistics are still very concerning. Lockdown 2019, COVID-19 hasn't reduced or stopped racism in this area. Next, Anya. Okay. So these are statistics that we got from the PSNI website, the new report that was published, and you'll be able to see it. Am I? Sorry, Anya. Okay. And this statistic shows that only 10.6% of race crimes in the district area from January to 20 resulted in an outcome. And please note that this includes maybe charges or summons, cautions, community resolutions, penalty or notices. Of those reported to the PSNI, more than 80% of race crimes do not result to prosecution or even warnings. Many racist incidents and crimes go unreported due to lack of trust in the justice system. A lot of people do not want to do the fear and stress of reporting when they know that the probability is that they will not receive justice. What's happened? <laughs> so one of the good example is the latest, I think we mentioned that. Go to the next one, Enya. Okay. So obviously these tables paint a very sad picture of our country. Both racist incidents and racist crimes have increased over the years with a significant increase from the year 2012 to 2014. Racism is everywhere, so let's not kid ourselves. There is no area that is immune. There are significant low outcomes rates from 2007 to the present day with only 10 to 20 percent of offenses results in charges, summon, caution, community resolutions or penalty notices. Meaning that there are little or no repercussion for the majority of those who are committing these offenses. Next, Enya. So I think if we look at um, Black Lives, the way the Black Lives Matter protests were policed, by now we can all uh, say that we know it was the only protest that was uh, treated differently. The new figures also that were released by the, uh, the PSNI under the Freedom of Information um, also are very telling. BME people received a disproportionate number of COVID-19 fines. 
black people received 1.8.4% of the total fines where ethnicity was recorded, despite making only around 0.2% of the population. And the total COVID uh, fines given to people from all BIM communities was 4.21% of the total where ethnicity was recorded with the total BME population in Northern Ireland currently stands at 1.8%. Next. So it's fair to say the discriminatory policing of BLM protests exposed systemic racism in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, structural racism is something that is defended, it's denied and excused but its consequences towards our community is substantial. Since June 6, 2020, we have seen the real impact of denial of systemic racism, an increase in direct racist attacks to individuals, an increase in confidence to very dangerous people to continually attack people of minority ethnic backgrounds because they know nothing will happen to them. And when we try to expose or speak up, every attempt will be taken to try and silence us, including threats of prosecution under the Terrorism Act 2001 by those entrusted to defend and protect us. We know by now that the policing of the BLM protests damaged the reputation of the PSNI and the, co the confidence of many members of the public. Policing board report concluded that whatever the rights and wrong of going ahead with the protest and the difficulty of social distancing given the transmission rate for the virus at the time this approach was not lawful police ombudsman report also concluded that our complaints of discrimination and unfairness are justified substantive and conjured but only one political party has has been consistent calling for the psni to apologize drop the prosecution and cancel fines issued to, to prosecute to, to protesters. So let's talk about racial equality in Northern Ireland. I think we it is fair to say we are going backwards rather than making the progress we need when it comes to tackling racial inequalities in this country. It is worth noting that racial equality is very important to everyone here, not just us as minority ethnic people. The, the people with skills and labor that we need are hide, hardly going to be coming here if they are going to be treated as second class citizens or if they know that they're not going to be protected or their interest is not going to be protected. In fact, the Northern Ireland Lives and Time Survey on Attitudes to Migrant Workers in Northern Ireland shows that more than a quarter EU immigrants left between 2016 and 2018 health and social care and hospitality all struggle to replace lost staff. So what are the priorities that we hope will achieve racial equality in Northern Ireland? The first racial equality strategy 2005 put forward a range of actions. This included the most crucial action we need to start tackling racial inequalities and race hate crimes. Amending legislation to increase protection and plug gaps I, I now know that this progress, uh, there's some progress and this work has begun in November, 2020. The introduction of ethnic monitoring, we know that the report is now completed, recommendations have been made, but we are not sure when it will be tabled for discussion by ministers or even implemented. Hate crime legislation, we now know the recommendations that have been made, but we do not know when it will be implemented. In fact, we have been told that it will not be until after the next assembly term. And racism education in schools, public sector and within communities. Now the racial equality strategy 2015 to 2025 clearly highlighted the need for education to tackle prejudice, stereotype and racism in Northern Ireland. We think racial equality should be a uh, racial literacy should be a priority and not just the racial uh, the good relations or diversity uh, relations uh, diversity training or diversity competency training 
Next. So what can our local council do to achieve racial equality? As our local council, we believe that you have a vital role to play to help achieve racial equality. Local council need its own action plan to implement the racial equality strategy because racial equality has to be mainstream throughout the country. Anti-racism, racial literacy education in schools, public sector and within communities, not diversity or cultural awareness competency training. Mainstream racial equality. How many BME-led businesses has council supported in Derry to promote BME people, social and economic independence? Funding to go beyond advice and support or good relations work. We do need race relations work to begin. Sustainability of BME people capacity. I think uh, I, I was trying to look at how many organizations are being funded by council which are led by BME people. And I do know that there's a race equality forum here, but are this capacity being sustained properly so that people can really get on with work that, that is required to be done? I think proper resourcing of community groups to continue providing this vital work is key to tackling racism in, North, in, in this council area. Next. So about being proactive and being anti-racist. We know that a few elected councillor called out racism and unfair treatment of BLM protests. And I really want to acknowledge the uh, people before profit for really being consistent in calling out systemic racism, including tabling motions to hold PSNI accountable. And I would like to formally acknowledge this support here and to commend councillor Hacking with, for his unwavering support. I think uh, PBP councillors condemned the action of the PSNI in disrupting the Black Lives Matter protest in Guildhall Square on June 26th uh, and for issuing fines and threatening courts action against organizers and participants. This contracted with the inaction of the PSNI in face, uh, um, in face of large gatherings of breaches and in major retail outlets, PBP put forward a motion to support protesters, called for all fines and threats to, uh, to off prosecution to be dropped. PBC also condemned uh, Gregory Campbell and stated that they are fully supportive of the Northwest Migrants Forum and the BIM community for calling out Campbell to be held accountable for his remarks. I also want to acknowledge the support that the council has given by supporting those motions that were put forward to support our community. Next. So we were asked to talk about scapegoating. And when we were thinking about this, we had to look at what do we normally here when we talk about racism in Northern Ireland. We have seen scapegoating almost every time, again and again. The council used InvestNI, for example, who set an investment program to help refugees set up businesses here. At the end of the program, they are given a one-off payment of 500 pounds to set up a business. They are advised to register their businesses through HMRC. This could be detrimental to many families. They have no businesses, only a plan, no income and no profits. Many of these families rely on benefits and housing support to register a business, could cause their benefits and support to be stopped and they would have no source of income. So investing very little money, not giving really full support come across as scapegoating plus tokenistic. Next. So for us, we know that while COVID-19 pandemic is a recent crisis, racism is an enduring crisis that is inflamed in the presence of other crises. Whether it is hate crime on our streets, the treatment of Black Lives Matter protesters or Islamophobia, it, it's concerning in Northern Ireland is becoming more of a racist society 
and we are not talking about race and racism in our many conversations. It is also very concerning that political leaders sit outside of meaningful discussions about racism, where uh, from BME people discussing it openly is something sometimes a risky business for us because when we do, people either excuse it, they defend it, or they deny it. In order to cut, tackle racism, we must first understand how it manifests itself. Choose to speak up and speak, speak out. When it comes to COVID-19 and racism, none of these are precedents of the other. It is our duty to make sense of the opportunity by learning, helping others understand and taking action. And just as I conclude, I would like to say that we haven't really come across uh, anti-racist apart from community organizations that are doing a great, a great, uh, great work in promoting diversity and inclusion in Northern Ireland. I think we really do need our elected representative to step up. Just saying, talking and saying good things doesn't matter. Tweeting or po posting on Facebook is not action. To be an anti-racist is to ensure that you do tangible actions, tangible deeds that will support our community and reaching out to your own communities and talking to them, ensuring that they understand the language that they use or the inactions of the wider society in, in calling out systemic racism or calling out even the overt racism has a detrimental impact on minority ethnic communities. So thank you. Thank you, Lillian and Enya for that presentation. Um, we'll move on to our last presentation this evening from Nikki Yu and Kat Healy from the Foil Racial Equality Forum. Thank you for inviting us, um, Gary and Shaban Council, uh, for this opportunity to talk, talk about PrEP. And um, happy International Women's Day. I know everybody is saying that, but I'm just saying that as well. <laughs> um, also, I would like to thank Sharon for helping email back and forward to communicate, and Councillor Harkin for invite us to this meeting. Um, so BREATH stands for Four Race Equality Forum. Next slide, please. So we were launched on the 19th of September 2016. And um, BREATH aim is to generally promote inclusive for the growing and um, blame black an ethnic minority community in our local area, and um, a lot of migrant face issue with education, uh, information, employment, and access to different services, and especially with um, pay time. So we will try to form and help them as much as we can. Next. Next slide, please. So, as you can see, Red has sixteen full members, like um, Active Citizen Engage, Pavelita, um the Japanese culture group, uh, um, um, Bunko on the floor, so, and the rest, Saipa. So, as you can see, we have a large number of members come to our meetings. Next slide, please. And we also have social members like the Derry District Council, uh, Interface, the PSNI, the housing, and the northern northwest um, healthcare. So they are part of our supporting group too. Next slide, please. So as race take crime, um, that's a lot. Some of our members will come to us to raise the issue, 
and I do wear a different hat. I am a research grant advocate for Modern Centre NI. So if anybody who has issues on racing crime, I will communicate with them and listen to their problem. Um, what we do is that we will uh, see what they need. Um, racing crime first introduced for Modern Centre 2013. Next slide, please. So um, the advocacy service was first introduced in 2008 and funded by the police and the Department of Justice as a co-funder. And uh, the aim is to improve support to victims, uh, increase confidence, and also encourage them reporting. And um, why is that a lot of repeat victims do lost faith in the PSNI system because they do complain that they don't get back to them when they report something. So this is our uh, job to mend this breach to give them confidence back into the PSNI system. And uh, our coordinator is victim support and we also have uh, Lenny Cheshire as disability. And Terry is the advocate there. And homophobic, transphobic is the rainbow. And Ashley is the advocate in rainbow. And um, what we try to do is to encourage all our victims to report as much as they can because a lot of under report reporting. And next slide, please. As you can see on the race hate crime from last 1819, the incident is in the whole of Northern Ireland is 1124 and crime is 699. And last year, 19, 19 to 20, and you can see the numbers reduced. I think that is also part of due to COVID as well. Um, a lot of people seem to be under reporting during last year, and um, but you can see the increase of similar incident, which is youth being um, being targeting migrants, and also like a neighborhood youth dispute with migrants because they seem to be spending more time at home and. That will cause some of um, issues like mental issues as well because we lost that um, social life going out. Um, so that's part of the thing. Normally we listen to our clients and we will see what kind of need they need and we will refer them. For example, our co-organizer for victim support if they had a bad incident and they were injured and we can refer them for um, injury support, compensation, and then also if they need counselling, we can refer them to um, supporting group and support. And at the moment, because they don't do um, minors um, support, so we have to ask them to go back to the school or go back to the doctors to talk to the doctor in the school to get recommendation for the youth um, you, um, because a lot sometimes a lot of things happen in school and they need support on that so if they do need counseling they have to go to the doctor or back to the school for that um, what what our aim is to ask our repeat victim to uh, keep reporting incidents or write it down in their daily diaries if that happens quite a lot and because we don't want them to ring the police every single day but if they could write it down weekly or and then just report and tell the officer what's been happening 
this one the best way to do it. Um, so basically, we would see. Sometimes we get wrong referrals, but that's okay. And we work very closely with Breath to see what other people are needed because Modern Center do have uh, advice. Uh, advice support and the EUSS support as well. So, the, um, in nine, in year 15, that's when the racism, uh, have raised really high. As you can see earlier in Lillian's chart, that is because when, uh, Britain have voted Brexit and um, there was a lot of race issue with the European um citizens living in the Northern Ireland. So next slide please. So now I pass it on to Kat to talk about our breath uh, project on Beyond Populism. Thank you, Nikki, and you'll be glad to hear that I'm going to be very brief and there's only one slide as the last speaker. Um, I think it's it's good to have this as one of the final sort of slides as well, because it shows how things have moved from focusing purely on BAME and other interests and sort of widening, widening out. And it's been quite a practical on the ground evidence based needs project. So beyond tokenism came about as a result of a conversation that members of PREP had with Sue Divin at the start of the Peace Floor project when, when council was looking to put its bid in and to see what needed to be funded. Um, and we talked about the way that rather than having a completely separate Black, Asian, minority ethnic project, we might want to combine a few other groups so that there would be a stronger voice and so that we could have a look at some of the ways that those who have been traditionally referred to as Section 75 groups, those left outside of sort of mainstream, but also then adding in the local context and a project and a stream within Beyond Tokenism that focused on victims, survivors, and on ex-prisoners, ex-combatants. So we we looked at the way that a project could be worked up that could um, include all those different groups that are listed on the slide and think about the ways that they might have different needs within the council area than other groups have. And if there was a way that we could do exactly what the project's called, go beyond tokenism and actually start to tackle some of those issues on the ground. So we began with a launch that was very well attended. A lot of you that are elected representatives that were elected representatives before the last election were in attendance at that launch. Um, and we asked people to come around tables and to address what their own specific needs within those five different groupings that you see on the slide, BAMA, LGBTQ+, disability, victim survivors, ex-prisoners and ex-combatants were, and how they might differ from traditional communities on the ground and people that aren't uh, parts of those multiple identities. So from that conference, we were told that one of the biggest concerns was health and access to health services and a lot of issues relating specifically to the traveler community came up. So one of the next steps that we took was this process, this project had uh, a research element to it, as well as a publicity and ad advocacy lobbying element to it. So each topic that we addressed, we went and carried out a piece of action based research to start with. Um, and then we had a launch to, to talk to people and to see if their thoughts agreed with what was coming out of our findings and research. And then we put together a plan of action to see how to tackle each of these. So the first conference that we had as a result of that launch was about um, health issues and it was part of a large health fair. So in order to engage people and to get them there, we had the sort of get your, your blood levels tested and your, your blood pressure tested and you know all those kind of things. And we had a number of groups that didn't come from our sectors, but that came from specific health sectors across the city and district. Um, so that got a lot more people than would normally come to just a conference on health needs because they thought they were going to get something interactive out of it, and they did. Um, and that found then that we needed another couple of ways to engage on quite specific issues that were coming out that had a health focus, the main one at that stage being homelessness. And it was felt that the five groups that we're working with tended to have a much more um, direct experience, usually at some point in their lives of homelessness as a result of a multiplicity of needs, but also we're, we're, we're focusing on it. And, and this is just before 
the COVID period, um, we were focusing on it in terms of what we could actually do practically to tackle it. Another thing the project did once we saw that that travelers were a, a kind of a voice that was just beginning to come and engage with the BAME sector within um, Derry and Straban was that there hadn't been a piece of research done in quite a while that covered a wide range of travelers needs. Most of the research had had focused on smaller pockets of travelers or smaller specific issues. So we put a tender out and engaged and actually Councillor Paul Gallagher was directly involved in the research because the Migrant Center worked with Straban I through the project to do this to make sure that travelers in Straban were specifically covered as well. And because the I project had quite a lot of direct engagement with travelers. So that piece of research was published and led to a number of actions coming out of it, including most of you will be aware with of the, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission's research that was published and recommendations that were published three years ago had a direct um, role between the two of those. So in terms of actually taking forward what started as as research and then became policies, we've now reached the stage where we're we're bringing the things to action. So we're we're not just lobbying, but also seeing practically what we can do as well as talking to others to address the issues that we're facing. Um, I'm happy to say that the, the peace project and the peace funded element of beyond tokenism has been very successful and like the rest of the peace projects at the end of the month where we're coming to an end but beyond tokenism itself within the the council area has been extended because it's been mainstreamed into part of one of the peace impact programs so all the groups will still be able to come together and we'll still be able to address the issues that they identify we're having hopefully a celebration event unfortunately it'll be online just because obviously we can't all come together now at the end of the, the month, but that won't be the final end of the Beyond Tokenism project. It'll it'll carry on afterwards, and that's part of the, the big legacy of it. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kat and Nikki, um, again for your for your presentation. Members, before we, we move on to the, the the questions, just on on your behalf, members, can I thank all of our contributors today um, for all of their um, very informative um, and very well researched um, presentation. Some uh, statistics there, I think, um, are absolutely frightening um, that have been shared with us today. Um, some that most of us probably weren't even aware of. Um, some of the incidents that go on um, across our community. Um, and I think it was very important that we took the time today, um, as the motion stated, to hear from all of uh, the organizations here today um, so that we can lend our voice now hopefully um, in support of them and, and the work that they're involved in. Now, before I move the, the comments from members, just Sharon Shauna Cusick has just arrived. Um, so if she can be marked present and just members again, my chat box isn't working. So once we get to the, or when we're going through the questions, um, I'll, I'll see it if you put it under the chat box, but I can't respond. So the first indicated speaker um, is Councillor Jackson, followed by Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Jackson. Um, and I want to start by wishing everybody a happy International Women's Day. I suppose the speakers today demonstrated the important role, um, the vital role that women have um, within um, our society in terms of challenging um, discrimination and standing up for people. I just want to commend the work of all the groups that were represented here today. There is no room for discrimination at all in today's society. Mayor, um, it, it was it was encouraging to see the in in some of the groups the all island dimension, the the campaigning, and the reason for this is is important. Um, the the pe Irish people are are known throughout the world for standing up against discrimination. In any form, um, we've we've seen on this island the scourge of sectarianism for far too long. We've seen um, and we've seen um, instances of racism, and the, but despite the, the despite the the fact that we've um, as an Irish nation we've we've been world renowned for for standing up and tackling um, this that this type of activities, we, we're we're still seeing. The rise of the far right here in Ireland. Um, so, if we're going to mount an effective opposition to the far right, um, it's it's important that we do it on an all island basis. 
we do it. Um, we, we don't do appeasement. Um, um, we do it wholeheartedly. So, Mayor, um, the figures that Lillian, um, or whoever has presented us to in front of us today, are worrying. They are. They are deeply concerning, and it is deeply concerning that there's that, that, that we have we have seen instances here in our city and district where there's groups um, that are organising on the back of far right ideology. Um, so it is important that we take a united stand here today and, and going forward, that we're united against racism, we're, we're, we're united against all forms of discrimination. And we we continue on that front because um, if, if we're going to tackle it and we're going to create a fair and equal society, it's going to take all of us. So on that basis, Mayor, um, I just want to thank every single one um, of, of, of the, who contributed to today's meeting and um, wish you all the best um, in your endeavours going forward. And I know as a party, um, we will um, be fully supportive of your campaigns. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to all the speakers today, and, and, and happy International Women's Day. Um, I, I sat and listened to today, and uh, I was part of um, Choose to Challenge there on Saturday, and, and some of the, the stories coming out would make you wonder, you know, how, how can we change things, how can we make things um, better for people? So I have a few questions, and, and I suppose one day, Everybody and everybody that took part, you know, we, we do live in a society that is so divided and it's so, as human, we are very insular, so we, we focus on the green and orange sectarian aspects of things. How do we focus our politics past that to truly try and tackle all the different uh, um, aspects of discrimination and racism and, and as uh, all of it? Um, I, I know previously I've spoken with Nikki at uh, the drug, uh, uh, the review of hate crimes, and she told me that there was a, a, an issue around translation with the PSNA, and, and hate crimes weren't necessarily being recorded because people were having aspects and barriers put in, for, in front of them. Because when they did report, you know, there wasn't a translator available for them. And I wanted to ask Nikki if if she'd seen that improved, or if there was ways in which she she felt that could be. Um, handled better. Also, um, a question for Lillian and Enya. I, I remember um, going up to one of their Hustings events and very um, well attended by some of our younger generation. And I remember someone saying to me that a lot of our younger generation aren't identifying from either community, whether it be from um, PUL or the you know Catholic nationalist background. Do you see that it's sort of shocking then to see the figures that 16 year olds or uh, 16 to 24 year olds are having such high statistics when it comes to not wanting people from different cultures being their neighbours. Do you see a, a, a coalition there? Do you, would you not find them being more open minded? I, I just wanted to kind of ask around those. And then the hate crime, I just wanted everybody's kind of view on the hate crime review. I know that there's 34 recommendations, but just to ask if there's anything that they felt that was missed by that that review. So just those, and I, I want to say thank you very much for today. And I really appreciate your presentations and any help and any support that we can do. We're, we're fully behind you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, Nikki, is there anything you wish to come back on there? Yes. Um... With the police, they do have um, translation on their phone 24-7, so they can easily um, pick up their phone and find an interpreter to speak on their behalf, translate on their behalf. But sometimes police officers find if they could understand the victim, they don't use the 24-7 uh, interpreting service. So. I always advise my victim, if you are struggling... Nikki, just... excuse me one second. Sorry. Right. Lillian, would you mind uh, muting your mic, please? Sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, L N Nikki, sorry. So I always um, advise my victim that they should always ask the police to use their interpreting service 
on the phone to communicate with them if they want to explain a bit more because a lot of them maybe they can speak okay English but if they want to express more they will struggle to use the uh, more words so that's why I ask them always ask the police if you do have problems you know contact me and I will try to speak to the officer to get them to find an interpreter for them in a meeting and so on mm -hmm. even sometimes when TPS come back with English I will go back to them and ask them to translate it into their English uh, into their language to, to tell them what's the outcome of the TPS uh, result Thank you, Nikki, for that. Uh, Councillor Riley. Yes, Mayor, thanks for bringing me in, and can I like others? I thank all the speakers that we've heard from this afternoon, all female, all very well presenting their case, and it is um, great to have that all female presentation on International Women's Day. So uh, each of them are, are to be thanked for uh, for their presentation. I note in the chat box that not all of them have been able to stay for this part of the uh, of the commentary, but uh, but I, I, I do think it is important that we note uh, our thanks to each of them for the presentations that they've made. Uh, Mayor, I suppose it's um, it's worth casting our minds back to the motion just at the end of Feb or at the end of January when this was tabled, and and in the motion it did talk about um, a U.S. President Donald Trump and his words and his actions, not just in that month, but also throughout his term in office, and and the importance of language and the importance of actions and words coming from elected representatives. Um, Obviously, people will recall what happened uh, at the end of his presidential term and the incitement and the language that he was using uh, and how that reflects into people's actions uh, in a way that uh, that nobody uh, in their right mind wanted to see. So I think that it is worth noting that the motion that was passed uh, at the end of January was passed unanimously. Uh, and it is important, therefore, that in, in this virtual chamber, uh, where we're meeting today, that people continue to add their voice unanimously to the the, the types of uh, issues and the types of uh, calls that are being made by the the different eight speakers here this afternoon. Uh, Mayor, I suppose in relation to uh, you know what people have said about um, the fact that people in the, uh, who have settled, who have made this part of Ireland their home, do need our support and do need. To understand that are, that their their council uh, acts on issues that are relevant to them, uh, and I think that it is important, as uh, Councillor Jackson indicated, that Irish people, uh, so many generations uh, have travelled away from our island, uh, made their lives elsewhere, uh, and we as citizens here in this island have always spoke up for the their entitlements and rights in other countries. So it's only right that we would also uh, uh, urge and support people who are of different nationalities who live here in our council area to be afforded the same treatment uh, as, 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 uh, as everyone else. Um, I think in terms of the, the final presentation by uh, by Kat and Nikki in terms of the, you know, what's been happening in terms of the beyond tokenism uh, issue is very important because it's not just about words uh, in the chamber, it's about uh, council taking action and projects like uh, the Beyond Tokenism uh, project funded through peace plus one uh, is clearly a way of demonstrating that our council does take uh, these issues seriously. Uh, and it is as part of that peace monies, uh, the European peace uh, monies uh, that, that, that allowed this council you know, to, to do some of that work. Um, and Mayor, on that note, in terms of European peace monies, in terms of working together on the partnership approach that uh, was espoused in this, in the presentations earlier today. Uh, I'll finish my remarks just by commenting uh, about uh, our party uh, president uh, and former leader uh, John Hume, uh, who said at uh, many times throughout his career, uh, but specifically is remembered for his quote about difference. Uh, John practiced that not just in terms of uh, uh, you know his own party, and and I recall. Back when I was joining the party, that uh, in the year two thousand, John, uh, as party leader, I made it clear that uh, anti-racism was part of uh, the SDLP pledge of elected representatives, 
you know, so uh, that that was ingrained in SDLP representatives, uh, you know, uh, from the party's inception. Uh, but I think, you know, his quote uh, that I'll finish with, Mayor, is that difference is the essence of humanity. Difference is an accident of birth and it shouldn't therefore never be the source of hatred or conflict. The answer to difference is to respect it. Therein lies a most fundamental principle of peace, respect for diversity. Uh, and I think that this afternoon we've heard all of the reasons why we do need to respect diversity and ensure that every citizen right across our council district recognises that the council is behind them in their ask. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Alderman McClantic. For letting me in, and thank you to all the speakers. As others have said, it is absolutely great to hear an all-female presentation team today on International Women's Day. So I thank you that all you strong women have come forward to to give us your views today. And I think it really is the rich diversity of our city and district at the present time. It you, you all add to that, and I think it's great that we have become a very diverse uh, city and district. And I thank you for highlighting the issues, particularly around racism, human rights, discrimination. I think that's something that we all need to be reminded of and to hear from your perspective. Um, I think it is extreme views from wherever they might come are always worrying and they're dangerous, downright dangerous. We respect respect the right of all those who have issues to come to this council to inform us and to look for support from uh, from us. And I think you've all, ladies, you've all used the opportunity today to promote the organisations that you are involved with. Where there is injustice, it must be called out. And as a council, I think be, it must be beyond tokenism, to use that term from that project uh, that was mentioned by Kat at the end of the presentation. I think that we have to be beyond tokenism. We have to respect all views. We have to call out discrimination and racism wherever it might come from. So again, ladies, thank you very much for your presentations on this special day. Thank you, Alderman McClintock. Members, there's no further indicated speakers. Is there anyone else wishing to make a comment? Yeah, Mayor, could I uh, speak? It's Councillor Herkin here. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Send on that message. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, like everybody else, uh, wishes all a, a, a happy International Women's Day. Uh, and I think that this is a, an appropriate uh, presentation or group of presentations for us to be hearing today. And it's great to see an all women um uh present all, all women line up with pre presenters uh, that's powerful as well and i just want to commend and thank everybody that took this uh special council meeting very very seriously you could really tell people took a took took the time to put together these presentations and they were all uh excellent and 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 really well delivered as well so thank you uh you know i think i can speak for everyone and everyone has obviously said that as well um uh, it was very, very powerful. Uh, just in terms of the uh, presentations, I mean, look, I will say that the, the one that really jumped out at me uh, was Lillian's uh, and Enya's, simply because, uh, you know, we, we want to think the best of our own city and our own district, and to see those statistics uh, about hate crimes and actually a rise in hate crimes is very, very, very worrying. Um, and I think that, um, I suppose we, all of us as councillors and elected representatives, have to do whatever we can to uh, push that back uh, and to discourage it uh, and to make that kind of racism uh, unacceptable uh, and to really try to push it to the margins of society. And, um, you know, th this is something that, uh, you know, racist discrimination, uh, anti Semitism, uh, you know, it, it, uh, and other forms of discrimination is something that uh, unfortunately blights all communities. Uh, this isn't about one community and 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 it's uh, you know utopia in another community. Unfortunately, this is something we all know we have to challenge in every community. Uh, and as Councillor Jackson said, uh, this is uh, this is an all Ireland issue. Unfortunately, uh, we are seeing the attempted growth of. Uh, a normalization of, of what I would call far right uh, politics, um, both sides of the border. Um, I mean, and, and I think uh, it's worrying that 
far right organisations are exploiting the the kind of pandemic uh, fears that people have and the different conspiracies. In fact, in many cases, the far right organisations are creating the conspiracies and then attempting to exploit them. And 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 you know, there's a lot of people who are looking around, don't understand what's happening, and are looking for explanations. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, far right groups, race, uh, racist groups, fascist groups here in Ireland are actually um, uh, offering one. And if you scratch the surface of those explanations, there's usually anti-Semitism. There's certainly racism. Um, and I think that that's why we have to be uh, on the front foot now and very vigilant about challenging this. Hence this discussion and uh, uh, and why we're all taking it uh, so seriously. Um, uh, Councillor Riley mentioned Donald Trump, uh, and uh, I think it's important that he did because Trump uh, was a president of the United States, and his words did have a big impact, in my opinion, in terms of creating an environment where you know hardened racists or bigots were emboldened uh, and, and feeling more confident that they could be racist. Say racist things and acted racist ways, and and that interaction of people who are in powerful positions, uh, you know, giving confidence uh, to uh, others, uh, I think is very important. Um, and I'm glad he's gone now from office, uh, but I don't think it's the end in the U.S. Uh, and, and this is why, uh, you know, the I I believe why uh, the DUP MP Gregory Campbell's comments were so dangerous because. Um, it's the impact that they have uh, on others in society who see them uh, uh, as a kind of green light to feel they can, um, uh, you know, treat people uh, as inferior to them, to themselves. So I think that this is all; uh, these are all things that we that we have to challenge. Um, so I, I, I don't want to say too much uh, because they're, they're, the the uh, presentations have been excellent. The two things I wanted to mention is, and I guess these are questions for the panelists, but I'll but I'll put it out there. Um, you know, the PSNI came back, and the Department of Justice came back saying that they couldn't do anything about the fines and the threatened prosecutions. Uh, I believe that they can, uh, and so I want to hear. I would like to hear the panelists' views on that. Um, uh, and the second thing is, uh, you know, I I think as a council. We should uh, stand in solidarity and support the United Nations March 20th Day of Action uh, for the uh, elimination of racial discrimination and fascism. I know that there's people who are going to be taking action in that day uh, all across the world. Um, I'm sure that's not the only um, idea that the that, that, that people who are here representing uh, very hard work and organizations could propose that we do. Uh, and, and if they have additional ideas, it would be useful to hear them. Um, that we can uh, take forward and work on, uh, you know, going beyond today. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Um, any of our contributors wish to respond to Councillor Harkin? Lillian? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, I actually remember that there was a question that Rachel did ask, uh, if it is okay for me to answer all of them. So Rachel did ask a question about the young people and how responsive they have been. We work directly with, uh, with young people from uh, 11 years to 18 years of age. And I have to say, I am so inspired by the the kind of uh, work that they do and how proactive they have become in challenging racism. I think, and I said this in 2020, that most people did not know that the protest that we call was really pressure from our own young people who really wanted to go out and protest against the uh, racism and institutional racism. And those young people are coming from across the community. It wasn't only Black young people, in fact, most of them who are putting us under pressure to organize that protest were from this community, and I was very inspired. So that age group is um, an age group that gives me hope for the future of this country. And the other question that Rachel did ask is about what should we do? I think for me, policies are great when they are put in place, but 
I think there's enough evidence now to show that there's a lot of policies that Northern Ireland has developed and has not fully implemented. If we go back to the Good Friday Agreement, and I don't want to get involved in uh, the political situation of Northern Ireland, but it is enough evidence that we are very good at uh, introducing policies, spending a lot of public funding in developing them, but we just shelf them. That is what has happened for the last 15 years in the racial equality strategy. So I think it is important that we now start examining ourselves and say, why are we not proactive in challenging inequalities in Northern Ireland? And what can we do on an individual basis? We, we talk a lot about a system. This system is run by human beings. It is people who are working in those systems. And if you cannot be proactive yourself, you are contributing to the problem. You are part of the problem. So it's about asking those questions and making sure that if you have spent public funding to develop policy, you want to see them working, they have to be implemented. So that's a challenge for our elected representative. All of you here represent political parties in Stormont. Why is the racial equality not implemented? That's for you to answer, not us. When it comes to uh, Sean Harkin has asked about the PSNI, I think we do know because we have seen in England that uh, those those black people who are threatened for prosecution and fined, they, their fines have been re returned, their money has been returned, the fines have been rekindled, and uh, the threats of prosecu prosecution have been uh, dropped. What is stopping Northern Ireland? If you guys have an answer, you you tell me, because that is escaping the uh, escape scapegoat saying that the legislation is not allowing people to do that. The justice minister has continuously says that it is out of his hand. So do we have a, a justice minister who the order justice system in Northern Ireland just does not allow ministers to take action? We've heard a lot about, um, you know, operation duties and legislation. So who is responsible? Nobody wants to take responsibility. I think it is time that we become honest and we engage in really uncomfortable conversations that we have to hold people accountable and not scapegoating. Um, Sean, did you ask another question there? Or did I answer all your questions? I think that's them covered, Lily. Okay. I think. Must be. Lillian, thanks very much for that. We'll move on to Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I want to thank um, all the people who have come today to give us um, a presentation on a happy um, International Women's Day. Um, it's very poignant, some of the, the points that have been raised. It certainly gave me um, an insight into um, the situation that, uh, particularly, that migrants. Um, face um, and the support that we as a council and individual members should be given to um, you know, uh, particular groups along along the, the lines of um, the, um, the the Jewish organizations. Um, what I would say is, is you know, I, I would like to see um, the, you know, the racial equality strategy coming forward um, and it, it's disappointing that it, that it hasn't done so far um, because with so many other issues, there is only so much we can do, but Sean's right um, in what he says and that um, it, we need sometimes to be to be guided as well in terms of how we address um, these issues and uh, recognise and support a lot of what he had said. I think as well, there, there's a lot of lessons for um, for us in this chamber about you know, the language that we use um, and the way that uh, that we conduct ourselves when we, when we disagree with each other, uh, because you know, there's there are groups out there who whose primary aim is only division. Um, and as much as we disagree in this chamber um, about a range of things, um, I think that there's more that links us than divides us. Um, and I think that you know that's the one thing I'm taking away from from today. So again, uh, really appreciate the um, the presentations. It's certainly given me a lot to uh, to think about. And um, yeah, again, happy International Women's Day. I think it's really poignant that all of our speakers today have uh, are women. Thank you, Mayor.
Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you to all the presenters. Um, very multicultural uh, presentation, I might add, as well. Um, and addressing issues which go beyond BLM. Uh, and I've always wondered in the back of my mind, is it not time that the Black Lives Matter campaign became fully inclusive and changed to being an all lives matter campaign. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Alderman Hussey. Councillor Mellon. Sorry, Mayor, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, um, yes. I, just, I just wanted to come in um, and I won't go over what everyone else um, has already spoke about. Um, I know that I just want to associate myself with um, all but the one before um, comments um, around the support and the, the gratitude for coming here today as the presenters have done uh, and shared their experiences and the information with us. I just wanted to pick up, uh, and I know it's, um, we have spent a, a bit of time today here and rightly so about the issues, it's the issue of the online um, presence and although 100%, you know, elected representatives, people on any kind of responsibility uh, position needs to address and create policy and create change. Um, and it's probably why here in the North, we are one of the uh, areas that are highly legislated for in terms of that, but we need to see it in the practice. In terms of online stuff, I would like to say um, that I would encourage anybody, and I know this is a, a public meeting, that you know, saying things online does matter. Saying things online, you need to challenge. We are in an online society, particularly now through COVID. And if you do see comments, it is your duty as a person in society, whatever role you're in, um, you do need to challenge it. Report abuse, you know, contact um, whatever platform you're in, uh, and challenge those behaviours, those attitudes. It isn't acceptable to stay idly by, but I just wanted to bring up the online presence of it, Mayor, um, and that everybody has a part to play in that, um, regardless of what forum you're in. Um, it's not enough to laugh or sn and be too shy to, to apprehend anyone. There's buttons there, there's see up there, there, you know, there's a whole lot of things that people can do um, to stop the this, this spread of abuse in whatever form that that comes in. So I just want to highlight um, that issue. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, can I please thank you. speak? Thank you, Councillor Mellon. Um, I fully agree with uh, your comments there. Um, everyone should call out um, online abuse and no one should be, in my opinion, providing ammunition for others to abuse. Uh, people online, and that should be called out uh, as well. Lillian, were you looking to come back on there? Yes, I just wanted to respond to a comment that has been made about All Lives Matter. Of course, All Lives Matter, but I would like the councillor to actually tell us if he knows the injustices that has happened to Black people and where the origins of Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter started, because if if all lives matter, it shouldn't feel uncomfortable when we say Black Lives Matter. It should actually be very happy that there are people who are challenging injustice within our community. So if he can just respond, he knows where it is started and why we say Black Lives Matter. I would really appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Lillian, for that. Um, I'm sure um, Alderman Hussey will respond in due course if, if, if he so wishes, Lillian. Uh, but but thanks for that anyway. Uh, members, I have no further indicated speakers at this point. Um, um, sorry, sorry, Mayor, I have indicated to speak as well. Sorry, who? Uh, Steph Hannon with uh, the Kayla. Sorry, Steph, I haven't seen your, your indication. Sorry, my apologies. Go ahead. No, nope, um, no problem at all. I just wanted to respond as well uh, as Lillian to Alderman uh, Hussey's uh, comment. And I know that to some, all lives matter, um, you know, that term, uh, many people see it as a harmless and even an inclusive remark. But the fact of the matter is that is quite a damaging uh, phrase, especially when it is situated as reactionary to the phrase that was coined 
um, you know, Black Lives Matter, because it's based on an assumption that there is an equal opportunity, an equal society, and that there is no direct discrimination, structural violence, racial, institutionalized racism or inequality entrenched in society. Black Lives Matter more, okay? It means Black Lives Matter as well. And some of the hurtful confusion could very much uh, well stem from a fundamental um, misunderstanding of that. It's the fact that Black Lives Matter as well. And, you know, of course, we understand, you know, all lives matter, but particularly in this case, it's very important to be mindful of that. Thank you. Steph, thanks very much for that. Alderman Jose, I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Uh, thank you, and, and I appreciate the final comments there. Black Lives Matter as well as all other lives, you know, and I appreciate that fully. And uh, indeed, I am fully aware of the context in which the movement developed. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Jose. Members, there's no further indicated speakers at this point. Uh, I want to once again thank all of our uh, contributors uh, for their uh, presentations today, um, all of their uh, very informative presentations, some, um, in my opinion, very thought provoking, um, and certainly has made me sit up and listen and, and, and understand uh, what's going on across, or try to understand, I suppose, what's going on across our community. Uh, I'm sure the pres presenters will take some heat from the fact that members spoke in favour um, and support of their organisations and the work that they have been involved in. Um, so thank you all very much uh, for attending uh, today and for presenting to us. And I want to just take this opportunity to wish yourselves and all women across this city and district a very happy International Women's Day. Thank you all very much, members.